So it's Halloween coming up on next Thursday will be Halloween and um, I thought as a fitting um, subject for today we would talk about phobias which seems to be right in line with the idea of uh, Halloween. Uh, this is October 24th and it's Thursday and this is what's up with that for those of you who are watching on YouTube. And uh, tonight's subject will be phobias. As you can all probably see, my um, voice is not in the best shape today. Uh, I always get something when the weather goes from cold to hot or hot to cold. And so I'm going to see if I can make it through. I may have to take some hot water breaks to get my voice to work a little bit better. But anyway, any rate, um, We've been talking about this whole idea of the paranormal and about a world larger than the world that usually we get described to us by people in very materialistic kinds of outlooks. So there's some people who believe that we are just a bag of chemicals. We walk around and the chemicals interact in a certain way and everything is pretty much just set up from the very beginning that there's no other uh, thing to think about, no other uh, um, idea to factor in, we're just chemicals. But actually, I think most of us can generally see that um, there's something more to who we are than just chemicals doing things. So. The paranormal series and this uh, particular night tonight, Phobia, they uh, highlight <coughs> it highlights that we are we have an experience that's bigger than just our body and we are something more than just our body and what we see of the world is more than what we actually just take in with our eyes, nose, ears, mouth, tongue, etc. There's a larger overall picture. So there are a number of everyday events and a number of um, ideas and uh, experiences that we all have as human beings that point to a larger world than the one usually agreed by people who are very materialistic. People who are very materialistic will reject the idea that there's a God and they'll reject the idea that there might be something larger uh, that we are experiencing, that we might experience um, understandings of things that haven't happened yet. We might experience beings that are not in a bodily form at this point. They're either deceased or they're in some other form for whatever reason. Uh, and we might also come across um, many other unusual phenomena that defy category. And one of these categories is phobias. People oftentimes discover that they are very frightened of things beyond the, the danger seemingly involved. Of course, anybody would be frightened if you just miss getting run over by a bus or if somebody's got a loaded um, uh, rifle barrel pointed at your head. Everyone would be uh, frightened in that kind of situation. But some people are frightened when they see mice or when they see um, spiders or sometimes when they have to speak in front of others in a public forum 
Uh, and the range of phobias is quite vast. If you make a little investigation of phobias, you'll soon discover that there are lots and lots and lots of different kinds of them. Uh, and um, they fall into a lot of different categories. Why do people find it, uh, things that some people find absolutely of no danger whatsoever, why do some people find them very terrifying? And if you talk to those people who are terrified, who have the phobia, they will describe that they can't explain why. And you can say, well, there's nothing dangerous, and they'll agree there's nothing dangerous. But it doesn't stop the actual emotional chemistry. We have an, an, an internal reaction to something that's outside of us. And it defies reason, it defies logic, but we still have it. So this is another element of our everyday experience that uh, points to us being something more than just a bag of chemicals or some animal that got trained up in a certain way as according to its habitat and its environment. So um, we're going to talk about phobias and I'm going to give a quick overview of the subjects we hope to cover this evening. I'm going to talk about the basic categories of phobias. I'll talk a little bit about related subjects like panic attacks and traumas. And we'll talk a little bit about the nature of phobias. And then we'll talk about some therapeutic strategies. And we'll talk about how this takes off into the world of past life trauma and into the world of past life regressions. And we'll talk a little bit about traumas from hell. And uh, finally, we'll talk about um, devotional service, which is um, something that ties the whole thing together and is the antidote in a very good way for many of the things that we might experience. So, um, <coughs> if you look at literature on phobias, uh, you'll discover that there are three basic categories of phobia. Uh, one is called specific phobias. And by this, the general idea is that we have a fear toward a very specific situation or object. And um, these, there are very, very, very many of these types of phobias. Then there are social phobias, which we have because of being in a setting with other people. So we fear doing poorly in social relationships or situations. Usually younger people especially have a very tough time with social phobias, but this can occur with people who are much older as well. And then there's agoraphobia, which is a general fear of the unknown, the uncontrollable, being somewhere unfamiliar. So sometimes when people are placed in a situation like outside, someplace they've never been, suddenly they'll feel very, very apprehensive. And this is called agoraphobia. It's a big category all its own. Of course, many people would find, you know, sitting next to the edge of a skyscraper like this picture here, terrifying. There's some people who are not terrified at all by this, and some people who actually like the adrenaline rush that you get from, uh, uh, it's called skywalking. <laughs> and uh, it's quite big on the internet. <clears throat> it 
it's quite big on the internet because um, people like to take selfies of themselves perched, you know, off an I-beam somewhere or on the top of a uh, television transmission tower or something like that, hundreds of feet above the ground. So it's, uh, you know, um, vertical inducing to other people, but uh, they get a certain kind of rush out of it. Uh, most of us have a fear of falling from heights, but um, we wouldn't go so far as to avoid going into a skyscraper because there might be a window in the skyscraper. There are people who are paralyzed um, by going into skyscrapers because they're afraid they might come up next to the window and have to look down. And even though there's no chance of them falling out, their adrenaline goes and they feel very, very uncomfortable. So this is an example of a phobia. In fact, this is called acrophobia, fear of high places. So um, you can see that there's enormous quantities of phobias, and this is just a smattering of them, you know. Megalophobia, fear of large things, ophidiophobia, snakes, claustrophobia, fear of enclosures, uh, the lassophobia, which is fear of the sea or the ocean, tripopophobia, which is a strange one. It's the fear of things with holes in them. Uh, some people find it eerie or disconcerting to see things with lots of holes in them. Uh, mycophobia, fear of mushrooms. Um, acrophobia, fear of heights, we just said. Cholerophobia is the fear of clowns. Uh, arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. Sinophobia, fear of dogs. Chirophobia, the fear of bats. Uh, tetrophobia, the f uh, teratophobia, the fear of disfigured people. And aerophobia, the fear of aircraft and flying, as well as, of course, um, gamophobia, the fear of marriage. <laughs> So, some of these phobias are at least humorous to those who don't have them. Um, but um, there's an enormous quantity of these kind of things where something that most people find not very terrifying at all. I mean, there are people who are afraid of dogs. Uh, in general, <clears throat> if a dog is really aggressive and vicious, then most people would be afraid. But some people are afraid of any kind of dog. And of course, some people are afraid of things that really shouldn't be able to harm them at all, like uh, um, rats or bats or something like that. You know, what will a bat do to you? Of course, there we feel just something uncomfortable about the fact that they can fly around. But at any rate, we can see that um, phobias don't have to be logical. And in general, they are not logical. And that's one of the things that makes them phobias. And uh, they're related to things that are called panic attacks. Mm. Now, what is a panic attack? Um, some people have these where suddenly, inexplicably, a person will just feel like something bad is going to happen. They won't know why. And they won't be able to explain it. I had these when I was younger. And uh, um, at a certain time of day, I would just feel like everything was terrible that I was I would die right away and then a little bit later on in the evening I would have the opposite feeling the feeling that everything was wonderful like a euphoric feeling and I would go through a daily cycle like this which was really terrible at the time I was going through it but um, 
panic attacks are where a person, for whatever reason, sometimes it's a phobia. They are visually in contact with something that uh, scares them, like a, a bat or a high place or a dog or being in an airplane or being suddenly in a closed in area where it's very claustrophobic. Um, and because a person feels, we see this cycle here, you feel anxiety, you have a panic attack. And then you feel, I must be having a panic attack. And that causes you to become even more fearful. And it amps up. And pretty soon all your adrenaline is going. And your whole body is um, reacting to what is not actually a dangerous situation. Uh, in general, human bodies and animal bodies in general, they have uh, various issues that are, or various systems that are designed to take off when there's a dangerous situation. You can understand that uh, if um, you are in a threatened situation, there's some animal coming to eat you, that you should do something about it right away. You may have to fight the animal, or you may have to kill the animal, or you may have to run, or you may have to come up with some other kind of uh, strategy to save yourself. So the body is set for that kind of a situation. The body pumps adrenaline into your system. The body has you hyperventilate. So you start breathing very, very shallowly and very quickly. You get a lot of oxygen in your bloodstream. So if you have to run, you'll be able to run for a long time and not feel out of breath. And so all these physical things happen. Uh, medical uh, science tells us there's this little thing called the amygdala, which is a part of the human brain. And it starts to kick off all these various uh, reactions in the uh, entire brain. And the brain sends out messages. Stomach, stop doing what you're doing. You know, uh, Lungs start breathing very hard. Heart start pumping very fast. Um, you know, uh, uh, veins, you know, you should dilate, you know, various kinds of things are happening. So the whole body is starting to go through an entire biochemical process to ready the person to fight, to uh, flee, or to come up with some other strategy. So this is the nature of... Um, Panic in a um, realistic setting when there is actually some serious danger. But sometimes these things that happen in everyday life that have little danger involved will trip this entire system off in a particular person. And as a result, suddenly they will feel incredibly uh, fearful, their whole system will be revved up to the uh, extreme degree, and they will find, uh, find themselves not really knowing what to do. And this, of course, can be embarrassing, this can be humiliating, this can be um, actually in some cases dangerous if a person is driving or something like that. They can start to behave in a completely erratic way. So, phobias are in one sense related to panic attacks because a phobia can bring on a panic attack, but they're not exactly the same phenomenon. And this brings us to another similar phenomenon which we call trauma. Now, the trauma is something different than having an issue in the immediate um, present. If someone is trying to throw you off the, sub, the subway platform in front of a train, you could be terrified. And you would have every reason to be terrified. If someone was um, holding you up at gunpoint, you would have every reason to be terrified. Um, 
If you suddenly got a diagnosis that you have some fatal disease, you could be terrified. These things are all things that produce fear in the present. But we could have gone through a very traumatic experience in the past and now even though we don't remember it or sometimes we do remember it we have a reaction uh, the, to something that reminds us of it. Um, probably the most uh, um, illustrative of this kind of thing is war. Um, many of us grew up at a time where there was no war going on. We didn't actually uh, find ourselves on a battlefield at some point or another. Uh, I grew up during the Vietnam War period, but um, my draft number was very, very high, and they had a lottery system at that time, so I didn't get called into active service. But I had friends and relatives who were in the military. And when a person goes through uh, the experience of actually being on the front lines of shooting at people, and having people shoot at you, um, that is a very traumatizing experience for many people, even though the military does its best to get uh, the soldiers ready for what's about to happen to them. So uh, the military does its best to kind of get them used to the shock, the confusion, uh, the idea of knowing somebody and, and finding out that they're dead 10 minutes from now. You know, um, we try to get them used to that thing. But there's some things that never actually go away. They're kind of permanently etched. For instance, um, I knew that um, if um, for some reason I had to wake up my father. My father lived through World War II. Um, and he was in, in the military. So I knew that if I was going to wake him up from a sound sleep, I knew better than to touch him to try to wake him up. I had to call from a distance <laughs> to wake him up. Because if I actually touched him, he would start to like come up at punching, you know, like uh, he was in some kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation where it was life and death, even though he was just waking up from being um, asleep. And this was many years after the war, you know, so um, these things get etched into people's minds. And uh, I've heard that other people have had similar experiences with their parents especially if their father was in some kind of um, war situation. So there's some things you just don't get over very easily, and some people don't ever get over them at all. And it just takes a trigger, like being touched, like uh, seeing something that reminds you of what happened many, many years ago. Uh, and so this trauma can be buried or it cannot be buried. We can know what the trauma comes from. We can know what it was that traumatized us. And this is something that can trigger a panic attack or it can trigger a phobia. So um, when a person knows what has uh, traumatized them, then the phobia is a little bit more reasonable because at least they're aware of what it might be that could trigger them a second time. You can imagine that if um, uh, you almost got electrocuted or uh, you were nearly run over by a train or somebody tied you up at gunpoint, held you for a few hours uh, and ransacked your house or something like that, you could understand that certain things could put you back in that very uncomfortable, very um, extremely emotional setting in your mind. And that would be difficult for you. Um, and there's a name for this. One of the more common things is that it's called PTSD, post-traumatic um, system disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, actually. 
So um, the idea of trauma is that something happens to a person that's very devastating and it overwhelms their ability to cope. So usually we have coping mechanisms when we have difficulties. We have strategies that we unwind, strategies where we slough it off. And we think, okay, okay, I'm just going to move on with my life. I'm not going to let this bother me. But depending on the kind of mind that you have, and depending on the kind of emotional um, world and emotional uh, state that you're in, some of these things do not just simply wash away. A person carries this deep scar in the internal part of their consciousness and it just stays and something can trigger it and this is what we call trauma. So trauma is different from panic attacks because it has to do with a real life event usually and it happened in the past sometime. So um, generally speaking people who have been in the military are quite prone to having some kind of psychological trauma. Now, I'm talking, of course, here about psychological trauma. There's also physical trauma, which is a medical term for something very different. So, um, let's look at the overall nature of phobias. What makes a phobia a phobia? Um, well, first of all, it's usually an irrational fear. And by that I mean that the person who has the phobia will understand that there's no real danger. In some theoretical way, they'll understand that there's no real danger. However, that doesn't help them. They still feel a complete physical reaction to the thing that, that gets them to be afraid. So, uh, in some cases, you know, like people have fear of flying or fear of driving in a car. And there's a very real risk there. It isn't, uh, it isn't a zero risk that you could actually die while you're flying or die while you're driving in a car. But um, those people who have these phobias, they find themselves unable to get in a car or unable to get on an airplane. It's just too traumatizing for them. If they want to get on, they will completely start to lose it psychologically. Even though they know there are other people in the plane as well. They know that people are driving every day and there's cars all over the world. Uh, still they can't get themselves beyond this immediate bodily reaction to the danger of being in a car or being in an airplane. Actually, I always had uh, intense fear of being on airplanes, but I fly so much that I've just gotten over it because I've had to go through it so many times, so it doesn't affect me the same way it once did. So, besides being irrational, usually it recurs. If you're afraid of one thing, then you meet it the next time, you'll be afraid of it again. If it's rats, or if it's dogs, or it's spiders, or even people are afraid of cotton, or, like we said, afraid of things with a lot of holes in them. Some people just seize up when they see things with a lot of holes in them. Um, so you can see how this would interfere with your everyday life. Depends on how common it is. If you have a fear of dogs, but you live in a place where there aren't any dogs, then you're not going to have much trouble. But if you live in a, um, if you have a fear of dogs and your neighbor has dogs and there's a lot of people that walk their dogs in the area that you live, you're going to have a lot of difficulty. So, um, every time you come in contact with the uh, item that causes the phobia, you will have this triggered response. So this is one of the things of uh, 
phobias. They're irrational and they tend to happen again and again. And people build up a tendency to avoid the situation where they might run into their phobia. Now, this can at first seem like a reasonable uh, type of behavior. However, it also begins to paint a person into a box. Because if the thing you have a phobia towards is quite a common thing, then essentially you'll come to the point where you won't even go out of your house because you'll be afraid of running into the thing that has the phobia. It's very uh, debilitating to run from your fears, at least to a certain extent. So there's a tendency to overreact to that when a person experiences a phobia, they'll tend to act out in some extreme way, which could be dangerous if they are in a situation which requires a calm um, outlook, like driving or some other thing. You're in an uh, airplane full of people. If you start screaming, you're not going to help people in the airplane have a, a safe and, and pleasant journey. And finally, physical symptoms. The, things about, the thing about phobias that makes them so difficult is that uh, oftentimes people will have a physical symptom and they can't do anything about it. They'll start to sweat, they'll start to feel hot, they'll feel dizzy, they may want to vomit, uh, they may actually uh, start thrashing around, they may go into a panic. And so these are very um, serious things that can happen if a person has a strong phobia. So I want to move finally to uh, now uh, some therapies for phobias. Uh, and in general, I'm more in favor of the lower ones on this list. But for certain people, any of these might be the right thing. So of course, in our modern world, uh, people uh, usually most practitioners and uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, they talk about CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, where they take a person who has a phobia, they talk with the person, try to explain to them, try to get them to explain what they're feeling, and uh, by trying to mentally put themselves in the situation which causes the phobia and understand how there's actually no real genuine danger, uh, eventually a person starts to feel less and less stressed out when they're in the proximity of the kind of thing which usually triggers their formula. And this is called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's one thera therapy for phobia. Another is exposure therapy, which is where the care workers will take a person who has a phobia and gradually expose them to their phobia, but in a controlled way, at a gradual step, so that they can finally come to the point where they're not so bothered by the phobia that they um, have the extreme reaction to. So because this is not just psychological, it's uh, emotional as well, so it takes some time, sometimes it takes a lot of sessions for a person to finally be able to be in the same room with the uh, spider or with the, uh, you know, bat or whatever it is they have a stream, extreme phobia for. And of course, um, another common route is this um, idea of medication. They have these things called SSRIs, SMRIs, MAOIs, uh, sedatives, and beta blockers. These are all basically strategies, medical strategies, that um, cause a lowering in the uh, what's called arousal. Arousal isn't just a sexual term. It's a, sec it's a term that means how much the whole body is hyperventilating, how fast the blood is flowing, 
um, what the conscious state is, how a person is viewing their, their situation. So these tend to stop the reuptake, is what is called SSRI, is specific serotonin reuptake um, inhibitor. So it keeps the serotonin from uh, having its effect in a, in a way that calms the person down, and SNRI is very similar. So at any rate, these are chemicals, which are brain chemicals, and they're supposed to calm a person down. Sedatives, we all know what they do. They make us sleepy or peaceful. These have their uh, negative drawbacks if someone has to resort to these on a regular basis. <coughs> so that's why in general, uh, I think these other therapies should be tried first to see if they work, you know, the uh, CBT and exposure therapy. And so of course there's hypnotherapy, which is what we've been talking about. That's how we got into this angle on uh, phobias. Hypnosis is a way where a person can be relaxed and the practitioner of hypnosis, the hypnotist, can walk a person through various subtle psychological states in their own consciousness. They can be made to remember something that if you ask them consciously, they would have forgotten. They can um, uh, experience something and they can sometimes even recall things that happened many, many years ago when in their present mind it might be blocked out. The tendency with trauma, sometimes when a person experiences a deep trauma, is to bury the event deep, deep in the consciousness and never to want to go there at all under any circumstances. In some cases, the person actually begins to develop a kind of amnesia where they don't even remember the event hardly. But through hypnosis, a person can go back there. And sometimes something that happened in very early childhood, which is completely forgotten in the uh, uh, adult life, can have an effect on a present uh, person's um, whole psychological way of dealing with things. So this is uh, something that's become a... Um, a psychological technique. It's, it's called regression. A person can be regressed into their earlier life and discover why they have a, a rational fear for something. Uh, they can go kind of like mining for it. The hypnotist will ask some questions and he will ask them to remember or put themselves back in a state where they were very, very young. And of course, this leads us to the next idea which is where, as this technique was being used by psychologists, sometimes they would go previous to the present life, and a person would actually begin to remember the events of a previous life through this hypnotic regression. And two weeks ago, we did a session on past life regressions, where this is now kind of a, um, a more common practice, that lots of people do these regressive therapies where a patient has some issue and the psychologist regresses the person not only to their early childhood but to their previous lives and sometimes they discover what trauma happened not in this life but in a previous life and by uh, being able to experience or understand that problem that trauma then in the present time the patient or the person who has the phobia will suddenly lose that fear. So there are examples of this. I'm not sure if it happens in all cases, probably doesn't happen in all cases, but I'm sure at least it happens in some cases. So, um, of course, if we engage in the process of meditation or chanting, this will also help to clear our minds 
because um, the mind is not just the brain, not just the wetware of the uh, five lobes that it has. It's not just this electrical discharge of various axons and dendrites. There's something more going on in the brain than that. And the self is much larger than the body. <coughs> so um, if we try to focus on the Supreme and we try consciously to enter a state where we are um, learning what it takes to make ourselves calmer, then in the long run that's a useful tool. And we'll talk a little bit today, too, finishing up here, about uh, devotional service. So, um, we talked about past life and past life regressions. So, through hypnosis, a person is regressed into their early life. And also through hypnosis, a person is regressed into previous lives. And this can find the source of trauma. And... Um, so modern um, care workers, some of them are psychologists, some are from other professions. So there's a whole uh, group now of people doing this type of um, uh, regressive work. There's a system to it and there's some kind of technique so one shouldn't just do these things arbitrarily without knowing what they're doing. But uh, there are people who are um, involved in doing this. As far as modern science goes, generally still these things are looked upon with a, uh, you know, uh, a kind of smirk that these things must be illegitimate in some kind of way. No one has actually been able to explain what hypnotism really is or what it does. Um, they've done studies on it, and many people find it effective. And uh, if something's effective, that says something, and if it doesn't uh, create any side effects, it's much better than some of the uh, heavy drugs that they use as an alternative type of uh, cure. So at any rate, um, hypnosis is starting to be accepted. Past life regression is certainly not accepted. In the larger scientific world, they think of it as being some kind of delusionary process. But um, as we've been talking about in this whole series, this so-called delusion is pretty good because it comes up with information that is otherwise unfindable. So we've talked about the idea of phobias, meaning that we have fear things in a past life. And we also can have fear of things that happened early in this life that we don't remember. But there's also this very real possibility that when a person is um, very seriously uh, causing disruption to others and causing them suffering, that person may have to go through a period in hell and in the Vedic literatures, we hear about 28 varieties of hell. And what's interesting is some of these varieties of hell are directly related to phobias. There's, um, uh, just to give a little bit of background here, in the um, literature known as the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the fifth canto at the very end of it, it describes, you know, um, how uh, people get sentenced to hell. And of course, in the Vedic system, hell is not eternal. You eventually get released from it. But it's certainly not a place I would put on my um, bucket list or where you want to go. You know, it's, um, it's a place designed for people to experience the backwash of the suffering they caused others. So, um, because in this life, people do vicious things to one another. Uh, there's a thing called hell where they get vicious things done to them. Of course, in hell, we don't have a normal physical body. We're already dead. So this gross body that we have now is no longer with us. 
Instead, we have a subtle body, but it's a special kind of subtle body, one that can experience pain and at the same time not be uh, completely destroyed and easily put back together. So in hell, there's varieties of suffering. And in this subtle body, a person goes through these suffering. And uh, then eventually, after they have gone through their karma, burned it off, then they're uh, promoted usually to an animal form of some kind or another. And then they work their way back up through various animal forms to be a human again. So in the cycle of uh, reincarnation, human form is about midway. Uh, we are uh, able to understand what we should do and what we shouldn't do. In other words, we have a religious aspect to ourselves. But the animals do not. So animals cannot get karma. If a tiger eats somebody, the tiger gets no karma for it. That's the nature of tigers. And um, when um, an animal dies, it's simply promoted to the next most complex form of life until finally it works its way up through 8,400,000 species and comes back to the human form. Of course, as we've said before, there's also forms above the human, uh, which are demigods, but that's another topic. So um, the process of reincarnation means that we can have within our consciousness, either consciously or subconsciously, the trauma from all these different kinds of things that have happened in the past. Um, so if we have been uh, traumatized in a previous life, in an early part of this life, or maybe we've gone through an experience in hell, these things can have an effect on us. And as a result, nowadays, we find ourselves very easily triggered by something that reminds us of something we don't fully remember, something we only half remember. And uh, through the process of devotional service, we gradually become purified from all these things. Um, the mind is kind of like a hurricane when it's in the mode of passion. We are focused on what we want, but because we're focused on what we want, we are unable to see the way things really are because we, we are too focused on what we want them to be. So as our consciousness is in the middle of a hurricane, we can't see things clearly. And we can be disturbed by things we don't understand. But if we engage in devotional service and we chant, and we engage with those who are trying to live a life of uh, um, self-betterment, then eventually we discover that our mind slows down out of the modes of passion and ignorance, and we begin to see things the way they are, and we're less prone to all this stuff. And of course, through the process of devotional service, we are also mitigating our past karmic debt, so we're not as likely to be taken to task by the system of karma. So karma is there whether we want to believe it or not. Karma is there whether we understand it or not. Just like any other physical law. If we cause suffering to others, it will return to us in at least the same measure, in some fashion. So as we become purified, we become reoriented towards service and away from the foolish idea that we can be made happy in this world by the things we possess, the experiences we materially have, or how people view us, our status in society. These are the things that people believe bring happiness, but these very goals are the things that entangle us into activities which eventually bring us down into um, very difficult um, karmic settings and eventually create some of these uh, 
issues that we've been talking about, phobias, panic, pain, suffering, entanglement of all degree. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, have anything you're interested in talking or saying. Oh, let me... Thank you for giving your lesson today. Um, I have a question about devotional service. Uh, how long does it take for a, for a beginner devotee uh, or spiritual seeker to develop a sense of um, inclination towards chanting? Inclination towards chanting. Oh, that's a good one. Um, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. How are you? I'm well. Hladi. Um, so, um, it's, it's the, the answer to that question is um, usually it takes a long time. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, what we find, generally speaking, what I find, what a lot of other devotees find, in the beginning, a person starts chanting, and they actually kind of take to it. It starts to really work for them. And then after some time, they find that the opposite thing is happening. They're starting to find it difficult to keep up with. Um, and this is because we gradually start committing offenses in our process of chanting. It's easy enough to chant Hare Krishna once, or even to chant a couple of rounds. Uh, but when you're chanting every day, and you're chanting 16 rounds every day, and it's not just some days, it's every day, then the tendency is to kind of do it in a negligent fashion, in a negligent manner. And then we start to lose that taste because we are um, doing it to some degree in an offensive manner. But of course the, the solution isn't to stop. That's the worst offense. You know, the solution is then to continue and try to be more mindful as we do it. So it's kind of like a thing where it starts and then it goes down and then eventually it comes up. And in the end, when someone becomes very purified, their chanting will bring them into ecstasy. And they won't want to do anything else. But that's a very high level, as you can imagine. Even in a famous uh, eight slokas, or eight verses written by Lord Chaitanya, he says, Nam nam akari bahudani jasarvashaktis tatrapita niyamita smaranena kala ita drishi tavakripa bhagavan mamo that my Lord, your holy name, is so wonderful. And you have made it very easy to approach you. But I am so unfortunate that I have no attraction for it. So uh, this is kind of uh, one of the things that um, chanting is the best thing you can do by all standards, at least according to the Vedas. That, uh, there's nothing you can do that will purify you faster and more completely than chanting. It doesn't cost money. You don't have to be specially gifted to do it. You don't have to have a special place to do it. You don't have to have a special time to do it. But the one thing about it that's very difficult is this idea of constant attention which is certainly what none of us are set up for. You know, our attention is always splayed out over many, many, many things. So because our attention is splayed out, to focus the attention on one thing, which is like chanting, is very difficult to do. You have to keep bringing the mind back, keep bringing the mind back, keep bringing the mind back. And that's why oftentimes we find it a kind of 
testing process. It's not, it doesn't taste sweet to us. And we have just been discussing the nectar of instruction in the uh, Bhakti Shastri at the Brooklyn Temple. And, you know, there it says that um, sugar is sweet, but to someone who has jaundice, that same sugar tastes bitter. However, that sugar is one of the cures for jaundice. So if a person eats sugar, even though it tastes bitter, eventually the disease goes away, and then sugar tastes, tastes the way it ordinarily does to everybody. It tastes sweet. So it's, this analogy is used also in the uh, idea of the chanting process. So that helped. Yeah. Hare Krishna, thank you. <clears throat> I don't know the format. Is it well, we're just, uh, we just had a discussion and uh, we're asking for questions and whatever. So you can ask a question about anything. You missed the first of the discussion. But, uh, okay, there's a question. But please talk into the microphone. I, I have a question, but it'll take a moment to pull it up, I think. Okay. The question is around this subject. <clears throat> so I look at my progress in devotional life, and I'm very pleased that I've stayed with the chanting, and that I've made some progress, and that I've helped many, many people come to chant. Mm -hmm. So that's very pleasing. At the same time, I find frustration in that I have these aspirations to be pure in my chanting and right, right. To, to be pure in my desiring and to have no other interest but Krishna and I find myself asking for that all the time mm -hmm. but I also seem to notice that it's not happening any of the time <laughs> <laughs> and that's curious to me you know right. um, what is going on that's the question right right well one thing we could talk about is this idea that there's a, um, a story of the marriage party where um, husband and wife get married and their honeymoon is across the river. So in the uh, end of their ceremony and after all the gifts are given and all that, they get in a boat and they go to sleep and they hear the Roman rowing them across the river. And when they wake up the next morning, they're still on the same side of the river, and they say, what happened? And the uh, people who were rowing the boat say, oh, we forgot to pull up the anchor. <laughs> so uh, that, 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 um, that's one way that we can relate to it. Of course, in another way, we actually are making progress, whether we realize it or not. You know, it may be incremental. Um, and sometimes, Progress is not a linear thing. It doesn't necessarily always just dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum. It can be da 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 whoop, you know. It can suddenly um, uh, jet up when we discover what the anchor is, you know. Um, and um, sometimes it's not easy to know what the anchor is. If we avoid offenses and uh, we try seriously to engage in devotional service, then in general we should know that we are making progress. Maybe the map doesn't look the way we imagine it in our brain. You know, I mean, the, the actual territory doesn't look the way the, the map has it in our brain. But we're getting there in some way or another. And in time, it will come. As... Um, that one verse in Bhagavatam, I believe it is, says that uh, one just has to remain alive in Krishna consciousness and surely purification will come. Provided, of course, we're avoiding offenses. If we offend Vaishnavas, then we've got serious issues. We're, our path to Krishna will be zigzag and we may have to actually leave the association of devotees. Not because of them, because of us. Um, Krishna does that, that if somebody is offensive to others, 
the Supreme Lord withdraws their taste for spiritual life. And once the taste is withdrawn, they, they don't know why they're doing it anymore. It seems like a, a perfunctory, completely, um, you know, um, hollow thing. So they stop doing it. But once they go back out into the world, they see nothing has changed. The world is still the same stupid place it always was. <laughs> And people are still doing idiotic things, and they're still suffering like anything because that's the nature of the way things work in this world. That uh, nobody gets a break. I don't care who you are. You know, you can be a demon, you can be a devotee, you can be a man, you can be a woman, you can be young, you can be old, you can be knowledgeable, you can be an idiot. It, 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 nothing matters. Everybody gets smashed in this world. It's just designed that way. To, cry, to gradually get us to wake up to the fact that we don't belong here. And so eventually a person says, all right, all right, it was me that made the mistake. i got to come crawling back. And a person does, and then they pick up where they left off because we never lose in devotional service. You can go from A to B to C in devotional service and then take a detour. But when you come back, you'll start back at D to E. You won't have to go back to A. So whatever we accomplish in the process of purifying ourselves, we'll always retain that. We may go through a detour if we make offenses, and that detour may take some time. <laughs> and so that's why I put a speaker out there so people can hear it and try and see if I can get them to uh, brave opening the door and coming in. But of course, today I sound like a big frog because I've got... Uh, as I was telling earlier, that um, because of uh, the way my body works, twice a year, when it goes from hot to cold, or when it goes from cold to hot, I always get some kind of voice bug. And it goes for about uh, a week and a half, two weeks, or sometimes a whole month if I treat it wrong. So I'm kind of losing my voice, but I wanted to go through with today anyways. So at any rate, um, that's the idea, that we are... Uh, we are making progress whether we think we are or not. May I just say something that's not necessarily yeah. a question? Mm. And I'm, I'm leaving New York in uh, about three weeks to go to India to stay there. <coughs> <coughs> and um, over the last couple of years, you've been just enormously <coughs> helpful to me. A great inspiration. Are really you leaving for a long length of time or just for... Nine months in Vrindavan. Honestly. Then I'll really? come back yeah, and uh, <coughs> stay with, uh, visit loved ones here. You know, I hope and plan, we've made some plans for me to do some preaching in Kansas where my little boy is. And, mm -hmm. uh, so he'll be there with me and uh, he likes that Bhaktivan, you, you know Bhaktivan maybe. Who? Uh, Bhaktivan Farm in Kansas. It's a bhakti center set up by some Prabhupada disciples. And, oh. <laughs> he has some friends there and oh, uh, I teaching don't know there. About. Yeah, it's, but I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very, very much. Mm. Uh, you've been very helpful to me personally and uh, a great inspiration. And I'll be carrying you with me today. Because <laughs> <laughs> your teachings are in my heart and your compassion and your wisdom and your love. So thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions that came up? Uh, no questions now. Um, thank you for your service. Hmm. Okay. All right. So, um, again, this is uh, Thursday, October 24th. What's up with that? And today we talked about phobias. Um, and um, next week, as we've made point, uh, will be the Halloween. And... Uh, there will be no program here on Halloween because instead it happens to also be the disappearance day of our spiritual master, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So that happens to happen the same day as Halloween. Instead, I will be at Brooklyn where we'll have a celebration for the disappearance of our spiritual master, which will be next Thursday there instead of here. And there won't be anything happening here. But the following Thursday again will be uh, going back probably to our um, stories from the Veda series uh, and I haven't uh, 
decided what the next uh, story will be. So 26 Second Avenue at uh, Second Avenue and East First Street uh, every Thursday, 7 p.m. Um, if you live in New York, come and see us. And I hope to get uh, these up on the YouTube channel, which is uh, the channel that I started some time ago called Krishna Was Up. K-R-I-S-H-N-A-W-A-Z-Z-U-P. And I apologize for today, my hoarse voice. But at any rate, uh, thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.